On this podcast, we go one step beyond publications and guidelines to speak directly with leading experts in interventional pulmonology. This podcast will address not only fundamental topics and exciting publications, but also unconventional topics for which the evidence base isn't that robust. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. This is your host, Dodit Chadda, an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And with that, let's dive into the next episode. A topic for discussion today is lobar stenting. Lobar stenting has historically been an uncommon practice due to complex distal lobar anatomy and the lack of availability of appropriate stent sizes. In addition, the benefits of stenting distal airways remains questionable. Our guest today is not only very experienced in the technique of lobar stenting, but is also the first author of the largest publication on the topic to date. Dr. Sonali Sethi is an associate professor of medicine and the Associate Director of Procedural Training at the Respiratory Institute, Department of Pulmonary Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Thank you for joining us on the podcast today, Dr. Sethi. Thank you for having me. Uh, Before we get started, do you have any COI to disclose? Um, I don't. I have done some consulting work uh, for various companies, including Boston Scientific, Biodefect, and Verisite, but none of that pertains to what we are talking about today. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So let's start by briefly discussing your study on distal bronchial stenting for lobar salvage, published in JOVIP in 2018. So in this retrospective analysis, over three and a half years, a total of 122 stents were deployed in 38 patients with lobar bronchial stenosis. Patients were only considered for stenting if they had symptomatic improvement after a prior balloon, balloon bronchoplasty and had a recurrence of their bronchial stricture. Symptomatic improvement was observed in 95% of the patients, 36 out of 38. Out of the 34 evaluable patients, only 76% had radiographic improvement. But of the eight patients without radiographic improvement, all of them had a normal chest radiograph pre-procedure. 93% of the 16 evaluable patients with PFTs had improvements with an average improvement in FBV1 of 12.3% with a range of 4 to 23%. So Dr. Sethi, with all the limitations of a retrospective study, these results are terrific and even better than many studies reporting on improvement of proximal airway patency in CAO. So what would you put this down to? I think um, the reason we had such such success was that we had, um, we were very selective about the patients that we chose um, to stent. We uh, only considered patients in whom we knew um, were going to have a benefit from what it was um, that we were doing. The majority of our patients had benign airway disease. They were mainly lung transplant patients. And we knew the patients were going to have a good response because we only stented them if they had symptomatic improvement, like you said, after a prior balloon bronchoplasty. So what we would do with these patients is they would come in, their pulmonary function tests were down or they were symptomatic. We would do balloon dilations on them. Um, They would go home. And a lot of these patients, because they are lung transplant patients, they continue. So they would, they would symptomatically tell us that they would improve, but in addition to that, they would keep a record of what their actual spirometry was doing. So we would see an improvement in their numbers, perhaps the next day, not that same day, because we do general anesthesia, there would be an improvement in their spirometry. And then you would start to see a steady decline over time, and they would come in and say that symptomatically they were starting to feel um, as if their symptoms of shortness of breath were recurring. So again, the only patients we would to choose to do this on, it was never a first case setting uh, with any patient we did, uh, it was a patient that we knew had a good response um, to balloon dilations that were done. We would dilate their airways up uh, depending on which airway it was, and at times it was multiple airways. And then if they came back reportedly having symptoms again, usually in about a one-month period of time, about 30 days, that would, those were the patients that we would consider to put the stents into. Okay, so this doesn't seem to be a technique that would be considered for every patient with malignant lobar obstruction. 
So in general, could you tell us what patients should be considered for low bar airway stenting? Sure. Um, the majority of the patients, if you look at our study that we did, actually did have benign um, airway disease, with the majority of them being lung transplant patients. The other patients that we had done is one had had a right middle lobe syndrome. Um, one of the patients had Wegner's uh, with associated um, airway strictures because of that. Um, another patient had lupus. Another one had had um, infection um, prior that had caused uh, scarring and benign um, and uh, benign airway strictures. Um, the, the patients that had malignancy mainly were, were, were few, and if they uh, had malignancy, it mostly was that they no longer had malignancy per se, but they were left with strictures because of radiation that they had had um, at that time. Um, any patient who was malignant, we would try to debride everything um, initially if it was like mm -hmm. a middle lower lobe, clean out everything, and only if they had symptomatic improvement after we had done cryotherapy or, or, or tumor debridement to bulking from an airway and it had recurred, and then they were getting post-obstructive type of symptoms, would that patient be considered for a stent? Got it. So am I correct to say that based on the potential physiological benefit that we can get from opening a low bar airway, the patients that we should consider for low bar airway stenting are lung transplant patients? patients with recurrent post-obstructive pneumonia wherein an obstruction may be palliatively relieved by opening a lobar bronchus and possibly pneumonectomy patients. Yes, absolutely. That is the, um, that is the patient population I would consider this in. Perfect. So in your study, there were a total of 148 procedures with an average of four procedures per patient. 71 stents were placed over the course of follow-up during the 42 months with an average of 3.2 stents per patient. The mean time to stent revision or stent removal was 85 days. I think you sort of alluded to this before, but uh, four, pro four procedures per patient over the follow-up period with 71 stent replacements. Were these numbers slightly higher than you would have expected? So we have a very stringent practice, especially in the lung transplant population, of doing what we call to be stent maintenance. So we, we routinely, um, We'll, we'll initially, for the bronchial stenosis, do a bronch where we will do dilations and whatnot. Depending on how stenosed an airway is, they may either come back in one to a three-month period. Um, at that point, a stent would get placed. And from the time that the first stent would get placed, we always, for the most part, reevaluate them in four to five weeks. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that the stent is sitting in good position, that they're, they're patent. And what we had noticed, if they were going to have any complications from these stents, you, you would see it kind of early on, and it would give you a chance to, to decide at that moment what to do. We, all, we always try a stent-free uh, holiday and or removal when possible for these patients. So uh, with the stent maintenance, after that one month of follow-up, patients get rebronched every one to three months, depending on how things look at that time as well as the number of stents that are placed. Obviously, a patient who needs a lot more stents placed, like if we have a lung transplant patient, for instance, and they have three ICAS stents placed in the right side and one or two placed in the left side, that's a patient you can anticipate is going to need more bronchs than someone who may have just needed one stent put into the left upper lobe or just one stent into the left lower lobe. Those are two totally different type of, of patient populations that you're dealing with. So that's why we had that average of 3.2 stents over the time period that you were you were stating. Got it. So you did mention that you'll use ICAS stents, and the atrium ICAS stent is a vascular balloon expandable covered stainless steel stent um, that is fully encapsulated in two layers of polytetrafluoroethylene. Now, these stents come in various sizes, from 5 to 10 millimeters in diameter to 16 to 60 millimeters in length. Uh, the stent has uh, recently approved, uh, been approved by the FDA in the U.S. for its use in management of tracheobronchial strictures. So uh, what features of the ICA stent make it attractive for low bar or even segmental airway stenting? So I think the reason we had a huge interest in this stent is, is first of all, because of the smaller length and diameter um, that these stents had. We had a lot of these transplant patients that were coming in with vanishing bronchus, and we would be dilating them, and we, were, we would have to dilate them again and again with repetitive bronchoscopies very frequently. 
and we didn't really have anything um, to keep these airways open. It was a stent we happened to stumble upon when we were down in the IR uh, vascular area and we saw them and we saw that there was ease in placement of these stents. Um, they could easily be put um, right through your flexible uh, bronchoscope um, through the working channel, a 2.8 millimeter flexible bronchoscope under direct uh, visualization, which meant it was very easy to watch it deploy um, right in front of you. So there was the ease of placement. Um, we, we did realize that even once you, you um, deployed the stent, that there was a post balloon um, in deployment that you would have to do in order to get the optimal radial force of these stents. And there was minimal stent uh, foreshortening that would happen uh, with the deployment. Um, so the, the length choices that you had were very good and the, and the stents didn't shorten too much as you would, um, as you would balloon dilate them up um, to the optimal radial force for them to be able to sit within the airway. Got it. And since these stents exp expand about uh, 30% more than their diameter, uh, do you sort of undersize these stents and then balloon expand them, or do you size them appropriately for the airway that you're targeting? So we usually try to choose a diameter that's about 10 to 15% larger than the estimated airway diameter that you're going to have. Okay. Uh, then with that post dilation, you're going to take some kind of balloon, whichever one it is, um, so you're going to, when you deploy the stent, you're going to put the stent in, you're going to take the balloon, it's a balloon expandable stent, you're going to inflate that balloon as much as it will go, um, just like you do a regular balloon, you're going to deflate that balloon, pull it out, but then you always have to go in afterwards with another balloon um, to dilate to get the radius of that um, stent up. Um, to get apposition against the wall. So we always choose a diameter that's about 10 to 15% larger than the estimated airway diameter that we'll have. In general, when you're talking about low bar stents, that generally is going to be something that's five, six, or seven millimeters in diameter. And then um, the length you're talking about is either going to be 16 millimeters or uh, 22 um, millimeters, um, depending on the segment that you're stenting. Perfect, perfect, thank you. So let's discuss the complications next. Uh, so the overall complication rate was 20% in your study and 59% uh, of the patients did not have any complications. So what are the common complications we should expect with low bar stenting and uh, specifically with the ICAST stent? Um, so I think the reason we had good outcomes with this stent is that it doesn't cause a tremendous amount of rate airway. So there's not a lot of pressure that this stent is causing on the airway. So if the stent is sitting appropriately and it doesn't migrate, meaning it doesn't come out proximal or migrate, it's not really causing any pressure or distal ends of the stent, specifically with coughing. Um, and because of that, there's less friction of the stent on the airway itself, which I think is why uh, the granulation tissue formation we had was only at about 5%. Migration, we noticed, um, was a, a initial problem that we had, and there was a learning curve with, uh, associated with how to deploy the stent so that um, we could minimize migration from happening. And what we learned was that if we had aligned the proximal portion of the stent with the lobar carina itself, um, or, or, or got it to sit just about five to 10 millimeters proximal to the bronchial carina, then the proximal edge of the stent could flange over the carina, which means it would, that folding it over the carina with, with the balloon and then later with forceps um, would minimize the risk of migration because it would hold the stent in place and the stent wouldn't migrate distally or proximally. And once we learn that flanging technique, um, we we then got very good at minimizing the amount of migration. So although we had a migration rate initially, that rate um, actually dropped um, as we became um, better at being able to deploy the stent. There, there was also issues um, initially that we had to learn on stent dislodgement. That specifically meant that if you um, deployed the stent but you did not um, um, go in with uh, your balloon afterwards um, uh, 
to get it to attain the largest diameter that the stent could go to and you inadvertently drove your bronchoscope into the stent, it was going to get stuck on the outside of the bronchoscope and then the whole thing was coming out. Um, so that was another thing we learned that once the stent deploys, everyone gets excited and you want to kind of drive your bronchoscope into the stent. That's not something you want to do until you have um, gotten your balloon and you've post dilated that um, stent up. Mucus plugging was, you know, about 1%, which I think um, you see in other stents um, as well. And that has to go again with the maintenance um, that you have to do. And, and we found that the best ways to maintain a lot of these stents uh, from mucus simply took a, a, a Fogarty balloon, um, either a number four or number five Fogarty and you minimally dilated it within the stent and you retracted it back towards yourself, that easily was a nice way to clean out all the biofilm um, that would accumulate within the stent itself and, and maintain and keep it actually looking really, really good when you'd go back in. Awesome. So a couple of important points there. So low rate of granulation tissue formation, 5% in your study, and a 10% mig migration rate, which could be reduced by phalanging the stent over the uh, lobar carina. And um, don't drive the bronchoscope into the stent after immediately deploying it. Um, I made that same mistake with my first ICAST stent and dislodged the stent uh, because I wanted to get a good picture as an IP fellow. <laughs> so anyway, uh, there are a couple of other articles that uh, our listeners may be uh, interested to um, check out on this topic. The Boston group has retrospectively reported their experience with the ICAST stent in 18 patients in a 2017 GOBIP publication. What I will briefly share is that the results they obtained were similar to Dr. Sethi's study, but only 28% of their patients had a benign etiology to their bronchial stenosis as opposed to 82% in the Cleveland Clinic cohort. The only other study that I found on lobar stenting um, was from a group in Israel, and they published uh, their 14 patient experience in JOBIP again in 2017 using the SMART or the Palmer stent. Another potential stent for distal airway targeting is the Aero Mini stent. Dr. Sethi, any experience using these for low bar stenting? Yes, it's a fairly new stent. I don't have as extensive um, experience with this stent as I do with the ICAST. It is something I'm learning um, about myself um, more recently. But um, what we do have is we have a size 5 um, by 10 or 5 by 15 or 6 by 10 or 6 by 15. So the lengths here that you have of these stents um, are different options. Um, these, this stent also fits in the working channel of a therapeutic scope. So again, through that 2.8 millimeter um, uh, working channel. It's easy to deploy. It does not need to be flanged. Um, it just needs to sit in um, an appropriate um, location. Um, and uh, you don't need to post dilate it um, after the stent has been um, placed. So yeah, uh, the self-expandable nature and the use of familiarity with these stents, uh, I, I feel may lead to broader uptake than the ICAST stents. But uh, you mentioned uh, the technique, but do you think there are any theoretical advantages or scenarios where you may prefer one stent versus the other? Yeah, so um, I think the only issue that I have with the Aero Mini is that um, you, it, it's very difficult to puncture a hole through the stent to interlay a second stent in it. Um, or if you happen to have a distance, let's say you're in the right lower lobe and the medial subsegment is there and you need to um, bring the stent back to that distal BI area for the lower lobe, um, you're unable to then poke a hole through it um, to make sure that the, the medial subsegment, for instance, is not um, covered over. Um, another thing that we also do with the ICAST stents a lot of time is we completely reconfigure or, or, or almost make airways for the patient where we'll put a stent, uh, you know, down in the right lower lobe all the way back up the BI um, to the right upper lobe and then poke a hole through it for the middle lobe, put another stent in the middle lobe, poke a hole through the soup seg, put another stent into the, the soup seg. So you kind of have configured an entire airway down there. Uh, again, this is mostly for the lung transplant patients who have that vanishing lung kind of syndrome mm -hmm. or bronchus syndrome. And this is not a kind of stent 
um, that I think could be used um, in that scenario. Also, the the, the, um, di the um, lengths you have on these stents are shorter as well. So if you're thinking of, di uh, of stenting like a right middle lobe, a lot of times I find that the measurement that I need for that is like a seven by 22. You need that 22 millimeters, which is a longer length. And the only lengths you have here are 10 or 15. So this may be better for shorter type of segments um, that you need to get into or a soup seg. So you've got to keep that in mind uh, when deciding which stent to use. Awesome, awesome. So this has been a really, really fascinating discussion. Um, Dr. Sethi, any closing comments, words of advice or caution for the listeners? Yeah, sure. So, you know, you always need to be mindful of the risks and benefits that you're exposing your patient to, and you want to objectively analyze every single case. You want to assess what are the options that are available for that particular patient. You want to keep in mind the evidence that's behind the biomaterials um, that you're using with these airway scents, and you want to be evidence-based and not dogmatic. Um, in terms of preparation, you need to also be able to exercise self-restraint. It's very exciting to be able to deploy stents, but you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. It's the right setting for placement of an airway stent. And you also want to always make sure you have the most experienced person who can place the stents um, that, that should be the person who's doing this until you get more familiar with it. And then always, uh, you know, have contingencies in place for, for problems or issues you're going to get into, such as airway obstructions or bleeding or misplacement. Um, so always remember, you know, rule number one is you never first want to do no harm to a patient. And you always want to identify that your patient's appropriate and do what's right by them. Awesome. Perfect. So this has been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Uh, also, I must congratulate you on becoming a newly elected member of the AABIP Board of Directors. So again, thank you for your time today, Dr. Sethi, and I'm sure the listeners will take away several pearls of knowledge from this discussion, just as I have. Thank you. With that, we conclude an exciting episode here on the AABIP podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. Do also check out our website, theippodcast.com, and please do provide us with feedback and suggestions on what topic and which expert you want to hear next. Until next time, take care.